So it's a, a great pleasure today to be able to introduce my co-author and never quite colleague, but friend over many years, Graciela Chichorniski. Um, so Graciela has a rather unusual background. So she's an academic who has no bachelor's degree. Um, she's from Argentina, and while she was an undergraduate in Argentina, I guess the universities were closed for a while, and there was a delegation of mathematicians came from MIT, and you were headhunted, basically, right? You recruited to go join the math department and did your first PhD in, in mathematics and topology at MIT. And then uh, some stage you were perhaps headhunted again to go to Berkeley and did a PhD in, math, in economics. So she has two PhDs, but no, no bachelor's degree. So rather un unusual. And she had a series of academic positions. Uh, so Harvard for a while, Essex, and since the 1980s at Columbia University. So early work and publications, uh, some on topological social choice, which is really a, a branch of applied mathematics which Graciela invented. And other work helped formulate the concept of sustainable development. There were some paradoxes in international trade which you uh, studied. And there was an increasing interest in environmental economics and the challenge of climate change. And there are two uh, books in particular that I'll mention and draw your attention to because it's rec strongly recommended and relatively light reading, I would say, on the practical economics of climate change and the politics as well. So the first book I'll mention is Saving Kyoto, an insider's guide to how it works, why it matters, and what it means for the future. And this is written from a perspective of someone who was actively involved in the negotiations of the Kyoto Protocol, and especially the part that helped say that there should be markets for, for permits to emit carbon. And a second book, Reversing Climate Change, How Carbon Removals Can Resolve Climate Change and Fix the Economy. So saving Kyoto was about controlling the flows of emissions, whereas reversing climate change was mostly about carbon removals. And Graciela played a big role in various, in the negotiations behind the Paris Agreement to make sure that the phrase carbon removals occurred where appropriate in, in, in the text. Um, so apart from being an academic, Graciela has been, is what one might describe as a serial entrepreneur. So I think her first company was involved with making sure that international bond trades could actually be uh, completed in the world before the internet. And I guess that was when you employed Jeff Bezos as a programmer to help make sure that was possible. Uh, the, of course, the founder of Amazon. Um, and Global Thermostat, I think, was a third company, which we'll hear some, uh, something about today, which is actively de devices that actively remove carbon from the atmosphere. And now you're into financing of those. So someone who's an academic interested in climate change and other things, but also a businesswoman. And Graciela, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here today. Thank you. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here with Peter and Peter, Professor Hammond, and uh, his colleagues. Um, I'm having a great time this week. Um, and I'm particularly pleased to be here talking with you because uh, the subject is not an academic subject now, or not, I should say, only an academic subject. It's, it's a very important practical, political, human subject. And it is what I think is most important for us human beings to get right now. 
uh, we're not getting it right yet. So um, this is what I'm committed to, and this is what matters to me. Uh, matters to all of us, particularly the young people here, but not just. So um, I thank you for the opportunity to be here and talking with you. It's my pleasure uh, to be with friends, long-term term friends like Peter and others, but also with new friends that I met this week. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Very interesting and serious academic department and very interesting group of people. I just loved it. <laughs> So I want to explain how we're going to organize this. The topic is enormous because it's really about the survival of humankind. And as you can imagine, it has many branches, to say the least. So what I'm going to do is brushing all convention, start with a short movie that was done by an Emmy Award winner, I give him a lot of credit, Paul Atkins, very well known in the US, um, which is very didactic in the sense that that short movie, we can call it a video if you wish, but it is a movie, um, is about 12 minutes or something like that, the last I recall. But it gives you really an understanding of what we're talking about. And I found that it is so complicated, the subject, that if I try to explain it, I finish a presentation and people are still asking me the basics. But if I show the video first, they get it. I don't know why. Maybe I'm just not very good, or the video is very good. I contributed, of course, to the content, so I, it's fine. Um, so we're going to do that first. Uh, so don't lose hope. You're going to say, well, she's not giving a proper presentation. She's just giving, no, 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 I am. It just starts with that video because then you understand everything intuitively. And then I will give a presentation, which is a PowerPoint presentation for another 15 minutes. And then the most important part to me, which is your questions. Uh, as you can imagine, I'm tired of hearing myself. That's why, for me, your questions are the most important part. But I do realize that we need to work together. Is that OK? If you agree, we can proceed. Good. The history of our planet is written in carbon. Billions of years ago, as Earth cooled from a fiery birth, its atmosphere was dominated by carbon dioxide, deadly to life as we know it. But a primitive organism found a way. Powered by sunlight, it thrived on the carbon and released oxygen, cleansing the planet's air. With life came death and decay, burying the carbon deep in the earth. For eons, it remained locked in rocks and soil. The 18th century, the discovery of the ancient carbon fueled a revolution. Economies thrived, but with unforeseen consequences. An alarming new report shows a record-breaking amount of CO2 in our atmosphere. This is the highest concentration of CO2 the Earth has seen in over Scientists from years. around the globe saying today there is... The Arctic ice caps are melting at the fastest and rate. Extreme weather becoming... Time is running out to prevent out. the worst impacts of climate change. Only by removing the CO2 that is already in the atmosphere can we prevent catastrophic climate change now? So I created the concept of carbon negative power plants. Now you can grow the economy 
create jobs, create exports, and clean the atmosphere of the planet. I see the whole world economy based on carbon now, not petroleum, CO2. The basic goods that humans need for survival are food, without which we won't survive for more than a few weeks, water, without which we cannot survive for more than a few days, and air, without which we cannot survive for more than a few minutes. We need to value them. If we don't value them, they won't be there. And if they're not there, we will not survive. By 2009, I knew that we had delayed reducing carbon emissions so long that now it wasn't sufficient to reduce the emissions and the burning of fossil fuels. We actually had to take out, remove what was already out there in the atmosphere. So I've been working with the United Nations and I created the carbon market of the Kyoto Protocol in the year 2005. The carbon market became international law. Despite legislation, the climate crisis remained unresolved. And Graciela realized the solution had to come from the economy. If by cleaning the atmosphere and selling the CO2, we make more money than the cost of removing the CO2, then you have a commercial feasibility. And why should that be important? because that will change the global economy, because everybody wants to make money, because we no longer depend on governments or on United Nations. It depends on the motive for profit, which is well distributed and well accepted. Even though the economists have to change the economy for climate change to be resolved, you need technology to do that, and the technology is physics and chemistry. I met Peter for the first time in 1996, when he left Princeton University to come to Columbia University to lead the Earth Institute that I was supposed to lead. So that was not a very good, propitious encounter with Peter Eisenberger. Peter Eisenberger quickly recognized that what was needed is a combination of economic as well as physical tools and innovations. So there was a natural collaboration between Peter Eisenberger and myself. The key notion was to close the carbon cycle. And I, I still remember the day when you uh, said to me that we should form a company to try to do this. And I said, what do you, what do you, we don't know how to do it. How can we form a company to do it? The urgent need to remove carbon from the air was clear to Graciela. The question was, could it be done in an economical way? The notion of taking CO2 out of the air seems improbable to many people because we've been struggling to take it out of the flue gas from our power plants. The first challenge one meets to see if this is feasible is to be able to move 3,000 times as much air as the amount of CO2 you collect because the CO2 is only 400 parts per million. It's very dilute in the air. And after a long search, we discovered that the catalytic converter of your car, which is this device here, known as a monolith contactor, is uh, the exact device we needed to do this. Up here, there's 640 of these devices. There's a fan behind it that's pushing the air through it. The air goes through. It has little cells. The little cells are impregnated with a proprietary sorbent. You need a, an agent in the walls of this thing that the CO2 is going to contact that will pick it up, not pick up the oxygen, not pick up the nitrogen, just selectively pick up the CO2. When the air finishes, it's clean. This captures the CO2, but that's half of the process. Now you have to release it. To release it, you apply heat, 85 degrees centigrade, less than what you need to boil a cup of tea. And there's lots of waste heat. I knew from my days at Exxon that the world is awash in waste heat. And that would make the process not only less energy consumptive, but it would be heat that we're already not using, and therefore would, would really reduce the cost of this technology. 
And what do you do with the CO2? You sell it for water desalination, bubbles for beverages, greenhouses, producing carbon fibers, dry ice, polymers or plastics that are renewable, synthetic fuels. All of that is a market that is a trillion dollars and it's a very hungry market for CO2. And therefore the whole process generates a world economy where the more you produce, the more you export, the more jobs you create, the cleaner is the atmosphere. It's almost impossible to believe until you start thinking that this is no different from the discovery of oil as the basis for the economy over a hundred years ago. Instead of throwing CO2 into the atmosphere, now you use CO2 to make money. So this is the CO2 economy, this is the carbon economy. We are replacing petroleum by CO2. For over 75 years, our region has been the leader of the oil and gas industry. In this new era, renewables and hydrocarbons enjoy a truly symbiotic relationship that is reshaping the economics of energy. And nowhere is this paradigm shift more true or relevant than here in this part of the world. I think the oil and gas industry understands that they are subject to enormous social and economic forces. For the first time, there is a future where the oil and gas industry is not dominating and has a different role. They have become the most volatile of all sectors of the economy. The CO2 molecule is as important now as petroleum was in the last century. Instead of farming petroleum from the soil, we take the CO2 from the atmosphere. We farm, literally, the sky. And the reason there is such a huge demand for CO2 is because there is very limited supply, very high capture cost of the traditional technologies, and it's very difficult to transport. Our technology requires no transportation and is the lowest cost. It's so low cost that when we sell the CO2 that we farm from the sky, we make money, a lot of money. Thank you. Thank you. And I really, I really can't understand, and I think it is too good to be true that you can take the CO2 yes, back it and manufacture it. It is too good to be true yeah. to me, and I like to... Anything transformational has a uh, propensity to be considered unrealistic, because people say, if this is so good and it can be done, why hasn't it happened? That's the question they're asking. The answer is simple. In the year 1906, the Wright brothers got tired of debating with engineers about whether planes can fly or not. It was a theoretical scientific discussion that took years. And the Wright brothers said, you know what, let's just fly. Right? And they did. The interesting part of the story is what happened next. Even though the Wright brothers flew a plane, therefore laying down to rest this scientific debate of whether you can fly a plane or it is too heavy to fly, for seven years after the first flight, the Wright brothers were faced with people saying that flying was impossible. And that's why it takes so long, because in the case of climate change, it was not just 
somebody flying a plane. I wish he was flying a plane. So easy as that. Well, it's an incredibly difficult problem to solve because you have to clean the atmosphere of the planet. Just think about it. It's, a, it's an enormous task. You need 30 to 40,000 global thermostat plant in order to clean every year all the CO2 that humans emit by burning fossil fuels, which is approximately 40 billion tons. If we start right now, the production of 40,000 global thermostat units or other technologies that will do the same thing will take between 20 and 30 years until it captures all the CO2 and removes it from the atmosphere. Do we have time? Touch and go. Big innovation and big change is not easy. And it takes time for people to understand, to appreciate and to learn how to use change. We are still learning with climate change. And I hope we learn fast enough that we don't destroy the Earth and the atmosphere that we share with other species and our own species in the process. So I'm talking about the new economy in which instead of burning fossil fuels, you are cleaning the atmosphere and out of that you create the fuel for economic growth. But will it happen? Yes, because if it doesn't happen, we won't be here to tell the story. It has to happen. That was the first part. I am sorry that the sound was low, but could you hear it? Good. So you can start thinking about the questions. Now I'm going to do the second part, which I hope will be fast. I want you to look at the bottom of that um, screen, which is that in the year 2019, um, there was an MIT technology review meeting and uh, publication that described the carbon removal technology, direct air capture, as the top 10 breakthrough technologies of 2019. Okay? So this is three years ago. That was curated by Bill Gates. And what I'm going to show you now is what happened since that movie in those four years, three, four years. Uh, this is about me, and you already heard about me, so it has the great advantage that I can go to the next slide. This is very important. Um, there are three publications that you can I mean, don't forget, I'm an academic. So what am I looking for? Publications, right. So these publications are critical to understand the role of what the movie was about and what I'm talking about. The, the publication says that the removal of CO2 and mitigation are urgently required, but you do need to remove CO2. And this reports validate that direct air capture is the only option to avoid the catastrophic effects of climate change. This is done by the IPCC and even by the US National Academy of Sciences, those three reports that you see there. It cannot be achieved by other type of technologies, nor by planting trees. So that takes care perhaps of one of your questions. And it's not me saying it, it's the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, which is the 
International Scientific Organization of the United Nations on this topic, and the National Academy of Sciences and others. Okay? So the carbon market of the Kyoto Protocol actually was created in the 1997, became international law in 2005, and was adopted then by the European Union as the European Union Emission Trading System, exactly the way I designed it. And as of the year 2020, which is three years, two and a half years ago, it was proven in, uh, and I can share with you the publication, that uh, by physics today, by the physicists, not by the economists, the physicists, that uh, the carbon market succeeded in what? When it was created, it, it was meant to reduce emissions to a certain level, and the market, the carbon market, was designed to achieve that result. Did it happen? Yes. By the date that was, by ten, the year 2020, we had reduced emissions to the level that the carbon market intended and what the European Union had by law uh, passed as the objective. Uh, so the technology exists. And you are saying, OK, if the technology exists, why are you bothering us, right? to come here and listen to this nice movie. So the answer is that we only have 10 to 20 years. It's not enough. The question is, can we accelerate this to the point where it is enough? So the main objective, objective of the company GTI, Global Thermostat Innovation, that exists now, which is one less than a year ago, is use policy so that the technology and the IP that exist can reverse climate change as it is needed now, because climate change is already occurring. So this is an economic solution to climate change because it can be made to be profitable under certain conditions. That's what you saw in the movie that I was saying in Abu Dhabi. So, you can read this, and you will have a copy of this circulated. So you don't need to hear me repeating what it says there. And it will be available okay, yeah, to everybody here. Now, you need to know that the science is clear now. To prevent global warming about 2 degrees Celsius, we must remove billions of tons of CO2 which are already in the atmosphere. I call them legacy CO2, CO2 because they are already there. We just have to remove them. Um, and we had to drastically reduce emissions. We know about reducing emissions, but the idea of removing what's already there, the legacy CO2, is new. So we need urgently a cost-effective, scalable solution to directly remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Okay, the, I can go over the, the graphs, but maybe over the questions. But just take a look at what it says and tell me if you have any question. This is what has to be done. It's enormous. It's enormous. But you say, okay, if, if CO2, like the movie said, can be used to power the economy, substituting for petroleum, then there must be a, a commercial market out there for CO2, right? I mean, that's a question. And the answer is yes, there is one. You don't need me, you don't need this movie, you don't need anything. There is out there an existing commercial market for CO2 that McKinsey, who does, and, and the report is, uh, um, ex uh, quoted here, is one, is 1.1 trillion annual commercial CO2 market. In what? Food and beverages, Coca-Cola, beer. There is water desalination, critical. And now it has been recently discovered that CO2 can replace electricity in the desalination of water. We'll talk about that. In Scientific American, there is an article. We'll talk about that. Methanol, 
which is essentially, uh, which is produced from CO2, is essentially gasoline. Polymers, plastics, uh, and, and aggregates, as I said before. But just think about aggregates because it's very important. Because the world uses an enormous amount of aggregates, which are a combination of cement and stone, for buildings, for roads. In fact, just about everything we need here can be satisfied if we use the CO2 for aggregates, concrete, etc., and we use it to build roads, buildings, etc., as needed, in the developing world particularly. Now, I'm not going to go over this because it would take too long, but this tells you about the technology. I'm a co-inventor of this technology, and uh, I'm a, uh, um, yeah, let me just finish there. And this is the technology that Bill Gates said it was such a breakthrough in the year 2019. And this talks about the advantages. And this talk about how the price of removing CO2 is going down. This is a well-known process in uh, the development of technology that depends on the market expansion and the number of units that is being produced. And economists call that learning by doing. And it's a law of innovation that it follows this type of curves, the, uh, the price curve. Now, I wanted to say, you, you may ask, well, if this is so good, how come the US government, who is housing this firm, you know, Global Thermostat, which I created, etc., why have they not adopted that into law? They have. There is a law. The most advanced law in this area is in the United States, which is unbelievable, because the United States you need to know, has not even signed the Kyoto Protocol. So there is a lot of debate in the United States. And I'll tell you about 45Q. That's a law that I proposed to these two senators, Senator Whitehouse of Rhode Island and John Barrasso of Wyoming, one Democrat, one Republican. So I'm very proud of that, because the idea of joining the two parties, if possible, if possible, is, is, a, is very positive. It provides nearly unlimited tax credits. Why is it not cash? Simple. There is a Republican involved. Republicans don't want taxes, but they don't want to help the industry, so it, it wasn't possible. But it happened. This is the book that Peter was so kind to mention, uh, which uh, I published uh, a year ago. And you are going to get a radio uh, program that is just is in Apple, the, in the Apple uh, channels, that just appeared this week. And it explains some of the most recent advantage, advantages and at the advances in this area, that's the book. So I'm not going to go into that. It's just too complicated. For, besides, it's more important for business person purposes. And I'm going to tell, tell you, however, what remains to be done now is enormous scaling up. Now, I want to remind you what happened to, uh, to electric photovoltaic energy, which in a process of 13 years went down from approximately 90 cents per kilowatt hour to one cent or even less the kilowatt hour. That is the type of curve that we need to follow here and is typical of learning by doing. So uh, we can talk a lot about this and we may in the process of responding to questions. And this is what I'm doing now is following the, uh, following the, uh, the uh, photovoltaic example of adopting um, 
learning by doing curves in order to drop the cost so that it can be expanded and we can do what has been explained already in the scale that is needed. That's it. Now, this is the update of where we are. And the next, uh, the next thing is the questions, which is the most important part for me. So do you, uh, I hope I was clear in what I said. A question can be, you can ask me to clarify, but uh, what's that? Yeah, so what you are going to receive from Maxine is two things. You're going to receive a, um, uh, an Apple broadcasting that was just produced two days ago about the latest developments. It's, it's, a, it's a radio program. It's a radio broadcast. You're going to receive that. And you, you can hear it, it's, but it's me talking again. The other thing you're going to receive is a copy of that movie so that if you forget, it has important information, you can get it. I could circulate the, power, the PowerPlan. Okay, I will send that to Okay, so you, you will have all this. So now the thing left is the questions. Thank you very much, Graciela. That was, that was wonderful. Um, I'm going to ask one sort of clarifying question first regarding the movie, because it talks about cleaning the atmosphere, and it gives, sort of gives the impression that we want to remove all the carbon dioxide. But of course, that would be a disaster, because we'd have serious <laughs> global cooling. So presumably, it's cleaning the atmosphere sufficient. I mean, it's like a thermostat. You need to control the temperature by removing just enough carbon dioxide. That, yes, and that's why I call the firm yes. global thermostat. Right, right. CO2 in the atmosphere, the concentration of CO2 can be used to control the temperature of the Earth. Believe it or not, that's what it is. Right. Marcus, you had a question. Yes. Marcus Miller is a colleague here. Your name, please. Marcus Miller. My name is Marcus Miller here in Bari. Sorry? My name is Marcus Miller. Marcus Miller? Yeah, at Warwick. And as I understand it, you want to reverse what nature has done by way of putting carbon into the atmosphere. And you want to reverse that with your DAC procedure. Now, there is a famous character in physics known as Maxwell's demon. And this demon wanted to reverse the second law of thermodynamics by separating hot and cold molecules. But it turned out that it was going to require more energy to do that than was possible to um, imagine. I'm just wondering, is your process actually physically feasible? You say you talk about making money, but does that really work? Yes. Uh, I signed myself with Siemens a contract to do what you are asking for. And that's what is happening right now. So we have important industrial partners like Siemens building the plants that are talk here. And as I said, we are now in the process, because it works, we are in the process of scaling it up for, so that the cost can decrease according to the laws of learning by doing. So the answer is what I just told you. Thank you. What you didn't ask is, can you do all that is needed in the time that is left? That is touch and go. And it may be yes, but it may be no. Am I clear? Go ahead, please. OK, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm Soren. Um, I'm What's your name? I'm Soren. Um, Sorry? Soren. Soren, S-O-R-E-N. S -O -R -E -N. Um, and um, I just had a quick follow-up question on that. Um, you said Siemens is already producing that. And have you already seen the costs going down um, over time? So have you already been able to like, apply this? This I, I, I mean, uh, when I'm sitting, uh, when I am standing, the voice, your voice comes a little bit unclear. Yeah. Go on, say your question again. Um, 
So my question was, um, since like Siemens has already produced those um, those filters, have you already seen the cost of um, capturing carbon carbon going down um, over time? So have you already seen the cost curve drop? Um, yes, we have already seen it. it has it has it gone down enough as needed? No. A lot more is needed. It took solar photovoltaic energy. Uh, solar power. Solar power. Um, but it's called photovoltaic. Yeah, solar power. Photovoltaic because, never mind. It, it took solar energy. There are many forms of solar energy. The form that I call photovoltaic, which is normally called photovoltaic, is the one that mostly the Chinese government, but also others, uh, expanded very, very rapidly over a process of 13 years, leading to a drop in the cost of energy, of solar energy, from 19 cents the kilowatt hour to less than one cent, 90, nine zero cents per kilowatt hour is what it costed at the beginning. 13 years later, it was costing less than one cent, which is what it costs today. So that those drastic revolutionary drops in cost are possible due to the law that uh, experts in the economics of innovation called uh, learning by doing curves. And they are in every new technology. There is a curve that as you develop further and um, the technology, but not just time, but also scale, then the cost goes down. But it is something I want to say very quickly. You, when you talk about scale, you think about larger and larger and larger and larger and larger plants. That's not what works. The scale is the number of units. So you need decentralized forms of um, scaling up the technology. I can give you examples. In other words, you couldn't produce one global plant to remove CO2, huge, and expect that the cost is going to go down. Typically, what you need is, as in the case of photovoltaic technology, is to build many units. And the more units you build, the more the cost goes down. So it's decentralized, learning by doing. Marcus, again. Um, I believe it was Kenneth Arrow who came up with the concept of learning by doing. And I believe he had an example, namely the production of liberty ships. The, the production of? Of liberty ships. Of ships, course. ships designed to help. Oh, so the liberty ships were the ships that they built in the US yards during the war, yes. transport ships, right? Yes. Yes. And their costs came down dramatically because they produced so many, which they supplied to Europe on land lease. I'm just wondering, A, did Arrow know of your ideas, Kenneth Arrow? <laughs> and B, do your, does your anticipated cost reduction um, somehow fit the experience that we saw in World War II? Okay. Yes, Kenneth Arrow, who died three years ago? Five years ago. Five years ago, yes. knew about it. He was a great supporter. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. But don't forget, this is not for the Kenneth Arrows. This is for engineers. This is for the Siemens, you know? This, but he understood, you're right, that he didn't invent learning by doing curves, which are known in technology. What he did, is he help the mathematics and the economics of it. Is that a fair statement? He fitted it into growth theory at the time. OK. Now, uh, the point is, where are we in the learning curve? The learning curve is going to go like that, right? And we want to be here. Where are we? We are at the beginning. And that's why I said, you know, Will we succeed? And the answer is touch and go. And the reason is touch and go is that this is a race against time because there are no points of no return. 
This is, these are not reversible processes when you do things like this to the atmosphere. So the issue here is, will we be able to advance with our technology and doing the, using the learning by doing curves, which are accepted? Nobody questions that. It's going to happen. But will it happen soon enough that can prevent the worst, most catastrophic, irreversible effects of climate change? The answer is what I said in the movie, touch and go. Because we have 10, 20 years max. For a technology like this, we are trying to change the composition of the atmosphere. It's crazy. So your guess is as good as mine. The only thing is, I have some plans to try to help produce that. Will I succeed? I hope so. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and these plans involve in some cases, new financial instruments, is that correct? Yes, so what I'm doing now is, okay, I'll say it once and you can ask more details. As you saw there, the market for CO2, which is, CO2 replaces petroleum. Petroleum was incredibly important for the industrial economy, and for that we have today, right? But we don't want it anymore, to say the least. But what we do want is to replace it by CO2. And as shown in that video, that's why I wanted to show the video, you have a large number of areas where petroleum is used all over the place. It's the C molecule, the carbon molecule. And that molecule is crucial in CO2. And there is a similar situation with CO2, and you saw the number of markets that CO2 can be used to commercially. And those markets can expand to absorb the CO2 that we need to remove and keep out of the atmosphere. It's not enough to remove it. We have to make sure it doesn't go back. So I can give you more information about that, but uh, the, it is touch and go. Because if we continue the way we're doing now and we don't accelerate, then we could fall into the, what I call the zone of no return. So let me give you examples. Uh, no, but I don't know if I should give examples or not. But you saw in the movie, which is why I wanted to show the movie first, how uh, general is the use of CO2 and how much it can help the industrial economy. And I have, now, I am now in the, in the creation of financial instruments and financial institutions. The first institution where I was critical because I designed it was the carbon market of the Kyoto Protocol that was created in 1997, became law in 2005, and by the year 2020, it demonstrated that it could do exactly what we wanted. But it's not enough now because that's a market to trade emission rights the rights to emit. But now we're not talking about the rights to emit. We are talking about the, um, it's the it's, instead of being the flow, emissions are the flow. You need to go for the stock. Okay, so that requires a different type of market. So I have created and patented a different type of market that I hope will be adopted. And the European Union is working on that, but uh, there is a lot more to say. I think that you have to take into consideration that even though today McKinsey says that the CO2 market, commercial market, commercial market is $1.1 trillion, there is a much bigger market for CO2. And that market is uh, ESG which is private investment in the areas of government, society, and environment. Environmental sustainability goals, is that? Sorry? ESG, what does that stand for? Environmental and sustainable goals? Growth, Growth. thank you, yes. yes. Yes, and G also stands for government. I, you, you can actually read about all this, but what I wanted you to know is that ESG dry powder, which means 
the investment from the private investment sector that has been committed to ESG goals with in private investment houses, Morgan Stanley, blah, 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 is 4.4 uh, trillion dollars. It's the largest market in the world. So people that are aware of what we're facing and they want to invest in trying to find a solution, which doesn't mean they're going to succeed, and at the same time, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the curves have to go down, the cost curves have to go down, so that all of this can happen. So there is a lot going on. So I invented some securities, <coughs> which are similar, don't get upset now, they are similar to uh, mortgage-backed securities. But they are not based on mortgages. They are based on other assets. Mortgages are assets. So these are asset-backed securities, which are securities traded in stock exchange. But if for some reason you don't get your money back, then because they are mortgages, you have the asset there. So people, investors love that. In, they are called asset-backed securities. They are so attractive that in the year 2008, when the banks, the big banks uh, around the world expanded their sale, they almost produced an economic crisis. They did produce an economic crisis of shape, of some form. But the mortgage market was very, very important. And this is something that Margaret Thatcher played an extremely important role on. I don't want to get into politics, because you may or not like Margaret Thatcher, but what we have here is something that replace, replaces mortgages but instead of for the building of uh, buildings or homes, etc., as Thatcher saw, you know, with a lot of vision, it's going to be for the building of plants, which are carbon negative, and that would allow the, 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 uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the curves, that, you know, the cost curves to drop as we need them. So that is... Uh, an instrument that is used in, which I now patented. It's, it is already approved as a patent in the United States, uh, which is very difficult, by the way, but it, it's done. And that instrument is, has a physical asset in addition to a security that can be traded in the stock exchange. And the physical asset is a put that is the foundation for all the power plants in the world, which is called, um, it's called, um, it's called uh, off-take. An off-take is a put. It means that you can sell at an agreed price for a number of years what you're trying to sell. In this case, you can have a put on CO2, which is called an off-take on CO2, as the asset that replaces the mortgage. And based on that, you introduce securities to trade with this dry uh, powder, which is the $4 trillion, that every single one of those dollars has to go, by definition, to the production of plants that will uh, increase the uh, learning by doing drop in the cost because it expands in a decentralized way. As you know, learning by doing is not any expansion. You can't just increase the size and expect the cost is going to go down. But you have to do it in a decentralized way, etc. Let me not go into that. So I think our time is up. Thank you very much, Graciela, for coming and giving our talk. Thank you for coming to hear it. And there's a, some tea and cake. Yes, uh, uh, so an, and an opportunity to ask Graciela more questions, uh, if you wish.